What is this book about? Globalize in LA is a study of trade, infrastructure, and regional development in greater Los Angeles, the five county area, from the fierce railroad and harbor battles of the late 19th century to the 20th century building of one of the world's greatest trade transportation complexes, to LA's emergence recently as the nation's leading trade center and Pacific Rim Gateway, and finally, fingers crossed, to new uncertainties and challenges regarding its 21st century global future. A major focus of the book involves the epic battles fought since the early 1990s over the nation's most ambitious trade infrastructure development plan, the $4 billion program of Los Angeles and Long Beach port development, the 2.4 billion, they use the B word in LA, we use the M word in San Diego, <laughs> in terms of infrastructure, the $2.4 billion Alameda Corridor Rail Project, the eight to $12 billion, it depends upon which mayor is proposing it, LAX Master Plan, which as we used to say in Washington DC is now in deep Sununu, and plans for a new international airport at the former El Toro military air base in Orange County, and finally $2.3 billion in planned NAFTA border infrastructure improvements. The book considers the myriad of challenges to these mega projects, pitting the forces of globalization and the economy against community and environmental resistance, and analyzes the strategies devised by project supporters and opponents. Got to increase sales. You want both sides to buy the book to shape Southern California's community, regional, and global future. But first, a few words about San Diego. And by the way, Stanford University Press has agreed to issue a new edition of Globalizing LA. It's to be titled Globalizing LA and San Diego. And it's exactly the same book. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. We here in San Diego, in a sense, have a very unique vantage point for studying Los Angeles. We daily experience and frequently resent LA's regional reach and global grasp, which in part has been created by its infrastructure dominion. Early on, these two urban rivals, located 125 miles apart, battled fiercely for harbor, railroad, airport, and regional supremacy. San Diego held the early advantage. It had a natural harbor, thought to be a prime lure for a transcontinental rail line. Not so Los Angeles, which only had shallow sloughs and unprotected open sea anchorages. When LA finally built a breakwater and began dredging a deep water port, San Diego's leading newspaper, shall go unnamed, derided LA's ambitions as a mere harborette. Later, San Diego would dedicate Lindbergh Field, its municipal airport, before LA created Mines Field, predecessor to Los Angeles International Airport. Attending Lindbergh Field's 1928 inaugural ceremony, Hollywood actor Wallace Beery wisecracked, if LA doesn't hurry up and fix up its own airport, it will soon be one of San Diego's suburbs. Yet San Diego, not LA, would prove to be the suburb. America's finest city, as local boosters call it, lost the key infrastructure battles. Displaying Bismarckian municipal will, an historian, retired state librarian, Kevin Starr's inimitable phrase, Los Angeles secured the transcontinental rail line and built what are now the world's third busiest port and airport facilities. LA and its suburbs also created the regional water system which serves San Diego. Los Angeles became the regional hegemon and one of the world's great cities, regional economies and trade centers because it was willing to make the huge public investments needed for growth. San Diego, however, did not. Our city may be Futureville, 
as The Economist dubbed it, because of its high-tech promise and NAFTA trade with Mexico, but its port, rail, airport, and water facilities remain woefully inadequate. As a result, LA's ports and airports, that's the reason for the San Diego edition of the book, LA's ports and airports, not diminutive Lindbergh Field in the port of San Diego, serve as San Diego's chief gateways to the Pacific Rim region. San Diego also depends upon an LA-based agency for water provision, the Metropolitan Water District, more on that a little bit later. The result of this regional infrastructure imbalance is a little understood colonial relationship between the nation's second and seventh largest cities. Arguably, San Diego's recent efforts at securing independent water supplies from the Imperial Valley, reforming airport governance, and developing its port and cargo rail facilities can be viewed as a belated revolt against LA's infrastructure dominion. Enough of the prepared remarks. Let me tell you in a briefly what this book is about. Like Gaul, it's divided into three parts. One part is a history from the 1870s and 1880s up until the early 1990s of a set of improbable and remarkable achievements. The coming of the rail line to Los Angeles and not San Diego, the building of a municipal harbor system, both LA and Long Beach, in the face of opposition from the most powerful political and economic force in the state 100 years ago, the Southern Pacific Railroad. We trace the beginnings of Mines Field, a mere bean field, which is now, as I said, one of the great airports in the world. The first part of the book is really how we got here and how improbable and remarkable this achievement was and how much of it depended upon a set of public entrepreneurs. Some you know, Mayor Tom Bradley, before term limits, where 20 years in office was in sync with the time that it takes to plan and build these infrastructure projects. More on term limits and why they're their enemy of capital planning a little bit later. Tom Bradley called Cliff Moore, the executive director of LAX, before the 84 Olympics, before Tibet, as we now know it, Tom Bradley International Terminal was online as it was being built. He called every day to make sure that the International Air Terminal was going to be ready before the 84 Olympics and it got done. We know about the Tom Bradleys. How many of you know about Charles Windham, the true father of the Port of Long Beach? The number two, he was alternatively the city manager than the mayor of Long Beach 100 years ago. But in a sense, his efforts lay the foundations for what is now the second busiest port in the United States, the Port of Long Beach, which battles almost annually with the Port of LA for number one status. Clarence Matson the general manager of the Port of Los Angeles in the 1920s, he was already mapping out a Pacific Rim trade strategy for LA. And we could go on and on. Cliff Moore and Francis Fox, general managers of LAX that brought that airport into the jet age and then into the international age, with a little help from mayors like Tom Bradley. These unsung civil servants were absolutely critical public entrepreneurs planning 20, 40, 50 year projects in Los Angeles that prepared Los Angeles for the global age. They were the true authors of the global gateways. And in many ways, this book pays homage to their efforts over 100 years. So we tell that history story. The second story, the second part of Gaul, that we're concerned with here are the challenges to this very ambitious, most expensive trade infrastructure plan. Trade corridors, 
port and airport projects during the 1990s, during the administrations of LA Mayor, now educational guru, Richard Reardon, 1993 to 2001. And the policy environment for building and planning mega projects by the 1990s was very different from the environment 100 years early, the Free Harbor Battle of the 1890s. We had a brand new, from the 1970s, environmental regulatory regime with environmental impact reports, environmental impact statements in the hands of project opponents. These were very powerful new tools and remedies to delay and possibly kill projects. We also had a new fiscal system, Proposition 13 and its successors, which dramatically reduced the amount of money available for local projects, port and airport development, and when there was money in the kitty for these projects, fiscally strapped local governments did everything they could to take the money from these so-called cash cows and put it into the general fund budget and fund programs much more popular with voters such as the police buildup under Richard Reardon. Capital projects were at risk in this new fiscal environment. And then added on to this new regulatory and uh, regime, fiscal and environmental regime, in the 1990s we got term limits. We got mayors and members of the city council whose entire sort of interest in these projects spanned at most eight years. The problem is these projects were 20, in the case of the Army Corps of Engineers and Port Development, 50-year projects. The costs were evident on the front end. These projects produce concentrated costs, environmental costs, air pollution, traffic, congestion, and the like. The benefits are dispersed. They're economic, they're throughout the region, and in the case of the ports of LA and Long Beach, throughout the entire United States. Well, the opponents to these projects, particularly those experiencing anticipated concentrated costs, the neighboring communities around the meg mega projects were very quick to organize. The supporters were much slower to organize, and no mayor or member of a city council could claim to be able, unlike Mayor Daley in Chicago, who does things in record time, the new Daley, they could not claim to be able to cut the ribbon and show the edifice, the new project, and its benefits during their short eight-year term. The electoral system, these new rules were really out of sync in terms of the next phase of infrastructure development and expansion in Southern California. And we San Diegans needed to be watching these battles far more closely than we did for the simple reason was that it's not only LA's global future, but it's San Diego's global future that incredibly depended upon whether or not we would get a new international airport halfway from LAX to here at El Toro in South Orange County, whether or not we would get separated grade rail connections from the ports of LA and Long Beach East. We are merely a spur line to Los Angeles in terms of our rail connection to the rest of North America. What LA was able to accomplish or not accomplish up there profoundly affected this region and its global future. And as I suggest, some of the things that we're now doing, the regional airport authority, we have a countywide authority now, but without an airport site, <laughs> We did have one or several, you know, many years back. We'll have to see if, in fact, there's another round of military base closings, either in 2005 or now, as Congress is talking about it, in 2007, and whether that will give us an opportunity to have meaningful choices for a true international airport beyond uh, the cramped confines of Lindbergh Field. But, the lessons from these fierce battles, community and environmental battles, revenue diversion battles from the ports of 
LA and Long Beach from LAX International Airport, the lessons down here were simply that we needed to begin to develop our own infrastructure. Our proximity to Los Angeles has been both blessing and curse. The blessing is that if LA had what we call the culture of Mulhollandism, the vast heroics public works project, and if they overbuilt an infrastructure, water, rail, ports, and airports, not only for a city, for a county, for a metropolitan area, but for all of Southern California, it meant that we never had to make the hard airport choices down here because of our proximity to LAX and Ontario. Look, today, 75% of the air cargo of San Diego is physically trucked up to LAX and Ontario airports. As long as those airports continue to expand, and as long as the freeway system connecting us to those airports is not permanently congealed, then we don't really have to make hard choices about airports. But both ground access and the ability to expand, particularly with respect to airports, right, is now severely being challenged. And it's about time, it may be a little too late, right, that San Diego, in a sense, is trying to get its infrastructure act together. So the second part of the book is about these mounting challenges, fiscal, community, and environmental to these mega projects in the 1990s. The third part of the book, that's where the fingers are crossed, is all about how Southern California can continue to be a global trade center, minimize the cost, maximize the benefits uh, as it begins to plan uh, over the next 10 to 20 years. Now that's the broad overview of the book. Let me just give you a couple of stories. I'm Irish, and of course, we Irish love to tell stories. Just a, a couple of stories that I think sort of illustrate uh, uh, some of the, the consequential decisions uh, that, uh, that were made uh, in the greater LA area. Let's start first with an historical story that's got a great San Diego uh, dimension to it. And that's the story of how LA got the rail line, the transcontinental line, the Southern Pacific line down from the Bay Area in the 1870s, rather than San Diego. And how LA, against the most powerful enemy and entity in California, the Southern Pacific Railroad, was able to build a municipal harbor 16 miles away from city limits, and then controlled by two separate cities, formerly known as San Pedro and Wilmington. They're now part of the People's Republic of Los Angeles. How that occurred is an absolutely amazing story. But first, the rail line. The rail line, you want to talk about really shaping not only the destiny of LA, but the destiny and the choices available to San Diego. It's the coming of rail in the 1870s. We in San Diego thought that we would get it naturally because we had, the, we had the natural harbor. The thing is, LA wanted it more. And LA was willing to pay exorbitant green mail, that's what we'd call it today, to the railroad to get it. The voters of LA County agreed to give the Southern Pacific Railroad the equivalent of 5% of the total assessed valuation of the county of LA in exchange for getting the rail line. We didn't do much down here. We watched. We hired a couple of LA lawyers, right, to defeat, right, the referendum at the polls. Today, 5% of the assessed valuation of LA County is about 45, they use the B word up there, billion, not million dollars. That's how badly LA wanted the rail line. Once LA had the rail line, the next battle became the battle for a harbor. And the Southern Pacific had other plans. They had a line, a rail line, and they had property in Santa Monica. They wanted to develop a railroad controlled harbor there. The good citizens of Los Angeles, 16 miles away. LA did not extend down to the harbor, 
the other harbor, Wilmington and San Pedro in those days. That's another story entirely. There was a titanic battle that was fought in Washington in Congress in the 1890s and right after the turn of the century to get the Army Corps of Engineers to agree to build the breakwater because you had to build this harbor out of whole cloth. It's an artificial, like much of LA, an artificial harbor. Uh, you needed millions and millions of federal dollars to be able to do so. It was a titanic 10-year battle to get the breakwater at Wilmington San Pedro. Can you imagine what the shape of LA would be today if the railroad had won that battle? If the harbor was at Santa Monica, do you know what that would do to real estate prices in Brentwood and Bel Air <laughs> and Pacific Palisades, let alone Santa Monica? Very consequential decisions. But then LA, once it got the breakwater at Wilmington San Pedro, being the kind of imperial city that it, it, we know it to be here in San Diego, had to figure a way to get from downtown the original Pueblo of LA is half the size of the city and county of San Francisco, 29 square miles. San Francisco's what? 49 square miles. How did you get the city limits down to touch these incorporated cities so that you could consolidate them? A thing called the shoestring addition. If you look very closely at a map of LA, there's a 16 mile, roughly, you know, some places it's only 300 feet wide little finger of land that goes down and tickles these two cities, San Pedro and Wilmington. You needed a concurrent majority to approve, right, this annexation. The people in the city of LA and the people in the shoestring edition. The people in the shoestring edition agreed to the annexation by, I think, 12 votes. The people in Gardena were worried that the, uh, the conservatives in downtown LA would banish gambling. I guess they're still worried about this today. Uh, and, and, and tried to, to defeat the annexation. Then once LA's boundaries touched, you then, Angelinos had to fashion a set of side payments, transportation improvements, the promise of New York style borough government a little decentralization and self-determination to get Wilmington and San Pedro to agree, to agree to be within city limits. And that was finally approved by those voters. But these were all improbable things. Another improbable story is the rise of the Port of Long Beach. It's called oil. They found oil under the bay. And guess what? Until the, the Supreme Court in the state took away the revenues, it was a wonderful way to build a port without charging the taxpayers or the shippers. And at the same time, it was a wonderful dredging program. The word is called subsidence. The more oil you took out of the bay, the deeper the bay became. Of course, the trouble was that Downtown Long Beach was also sinking into the bay because of subsidence. They had to spend hundreds of millions, right, to pump water in as they pumped the oil out. But Long Beach Port got an enormous jump start in the 20s and 30s because of oil revenue, and it made it very, very competitive with the Port of LA. Those are the kinds of historical, improbable, remarkable stories and the key role of public entrepreneurs that we tell in Globalize in LA. We also tell stories about the titanic battles over the LAX master plan. Who was the really effective mayor? Was it Richard Reardon or was it Mike Gordon, the mayor of El Segundo, who organized a very powerful coalition of the NIMBYs and the wannabes. The NIMBYs, the not in my backyard opponents to LAX expansion near the airport. The wannabes, the elected officials, business groups in remote areas like the Inland Empire, where they wanted an airport as a potent tool of regional development with its catalytic role in terms of job generation. Mike Gordon in many ways was the much more effective of the two mayors and what you see during the 1990s is the incredible downsizing of the LAX master plan 
from planned runways in Santa Monica Bay, that one got removed real quickly, to a 98 million annual passenger airport, downsized now to a 78 million annual passenger airport. And even that proposal in the hands of Mayor Jim Hahn is, as I said before, in very serious trouble. The environmental impact report has just been released. It's going to the city council. Mike Gordon thinks, right, that he has been sold a bill of goods, and he is resurrecting that powerful coalition of opposition. LAX probably will not be able to expand much at all. These are the kinds of stories, and of course there's also a 9-11 story about security. 2% of the containers at best that go through the ports of LA and Long Beach can be checked by customs. How do you protect against an Al-Qaeda-like terrorist attack? If you dropped a container ship or a dirty bomb in the main channel of the Port of Los Angeles, you would basically stop the flow of 40% of the international waterborne commerce to and from the entire United States. It goes through that critical bottleneck. Port and airport planners are now feverishly at work dealing, in a sense, with the new security challenges in addition to the fiscal, environmental, and community challenges that surfaced in the 1990s. Anyway, that's the book. But that is only part one of three, a preview of coming attractions. I'm involved and have been for the last 10 years in what I call the crown jewel saga. The mega projects, Hoover Dam, the Colorado River Aqueduct, LAX, the ports of San Pedro Bay, et cetera, that either, depending on your point of view, built or destroyed Southern California. The second of the crown jewels books, now under contract with Stanford and is really going to get me in trouble with some in this town, is called Beyond Chinatown, the Metropolitan Water District Development in the Environment in Southern California. If you think that the San Diego, LA port and airport relationship is complicated, wait till you see water. And then if I can ever go through the DWP archives, I want to write a book about what really happened in the Owens Valley. I want to write a book about LA's fabled Department of Water and Power, but they have kept every scrap of paper since day one. Uh, and it looks like that will be the project that finishes my career as an academic. I thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>